All right, so uh, I'm very happy today that our speaker is Madi Sultanul Kutabi. Uh, Madi is an assistant professor at the Department of Electrical and uh, Computer Engineering at uh, USC. He is also the David and Lucille Pack a David and Lucille Packard Fellow. He is also an Andrew and Erna Viterbi Early Career Chair. Um, Mahdi has done some really, really interesting work uh, throughout his career focusing on um, mathematical and theoretical uh, understanding and underpinnings of uh, um, algorithms, um, computationally efficient algorithms and optimization and machine learning, uh, computational images and, and, and many other areas. And most recently, I guess he's been uh, working on algorithms for uh, prov provably convergent algorithms uh, in the non-convex optimization uh, setting. Uh, he's also been focusing on um, understanding uh, the theory behind um, different machine learning uh, algorithms. So I'm very excited that he will be telling us today about precise trade-offs in adversarial training. Great, thanks a lot for the intro, Ryan, and, uh, and also the invite to this uh, wonderful seminar series. Uh, and it's also nice to see some of you if virtually. Uh, we, it's been a while since we hanged uh, out at a conference. So, uh, so basically today I'm going to talk about these trade-offs in adversarial training. Uh, this is joint work with colleagues, uh, Adel, who is uh, uh, at USC and uh, another colleague, uh, Hamed at UPenn. So the, the underlying motivation or in general, the broad motivation for, for adversarial training is that many modern learning systems are of course beginning to be used in safety critical applications, whether it's uh, you know, autonomous driving, the robotics, healthcare and so on. Uh, but at the same time we, we know and that they're very well documented cases of uh, these modern learning uh, algorithms being quite fragile. Uh, and, and so one, one of the well-documented cases is, is kind of uh, uh, perhaps a little bit toyish, but still like it makes the point very clearly it is kind of like uh, the fact that these training models are known to be extremely vulnerable to small uh, per adversarial perturbations to the input. This is kind of the famous example of how AI make, makes uh, pigs fly, right? So. So you, for example, you have a picture of a pig, you add a little bit of noise to it, a uh, very small noise, and all of a sudden your classifier classifies it as an airliner. And, and of course, over the past few years, uh, there has been a lot of interesting work uh, to, to basically mitigate this issue and adversarial training is kind of one of the ways that has emerged to, to mitigate this particular issue. And again, you know, like you could argue whether this particular adversarial model is the best thing to do uh, to look at or the most natural thing. But in any case, I think it's a, a wonderful example of, of basically the vulnerability of these systems. Um, so, so now uh, what is our specific motivation for, for looking at kind of uh, theoretical aspects of this? So, so we're really motivated by kind of a series of uh, empirical observations in the recent literature, right? Uh, one is uh, kind of like the fact that adversarial training has been observed to reduce accuracy kind of on benign test inputs. So, so you have these adversarial training procedures and it's good when you have an adversary corrupting your data, but actually if you give it an uncorrupted data, it actually reduces accuracy. So that's not good, obviously. And, and then, uh, and so this is kind of like, uh, so, so you, now all of a sudden you have to worry about two things, right? Which is, what is the standard accuracy? Which is like, if you don't have a corruption and what is like this robust accuracy, right? Uh, when you do have corruption. And so the people have observed that there's a bunch of trade-offs that arises when you, uh, when you do adversarial training between these two somewhat competing objectives. And, and so, and this trade-off is really peculiar the way it behaves. It depends on a lot of things and often in an intuitive ways. So it depends on the learning model, the number of training data, unlabeled data and so on. And I've listed a bunch of papers that very well document these issues but maybe just to, to kind of like look at one very specifically. So uh, on the right, you see two figures, one on MNIST, the other on CIFAR. Uh, you see the trend is completely the opposite on these two data sets essentially, right? So in one case, uh, like this sort of standard accuracy kind of uh, 
uh, it, well, decreases uh, more or less as you in increase the level of uh, the, you know, the, this uh, adversarial training parameter here, the, that's epsilon. In, in the other data is kind of the completely the opposite, right? The order is completely reversed. Um, so, uh, so, so that's, uh, that's kind of, uh, you know, so as you can see, we, the goal is to kind of be able to explain these trade-offs and what it depends on and so on. Um, so what are the challenges? Um, so, uh, you know, there, there is a, a fundamental kind of trade-off between these robust and standard accuracies, uh, perhaps, right? And uh, we, we would like to understand what is this trade-off irregardless of whether, you know, you have uh, infinite data or not, or, uh, you know, computational power and so on. So I see there are some uh, kind of comments maybe in chat. I don't know if there are questions. Um, uh, no, it's, uh, sorry. Okay, cool. So, um, so, and then uh, another one, uh, you know, another challenge is like, okay, so if, even if we understand the fundamental trade-off the, the, between these kinds of accuracies, uh, you know, uh, is there a way to algorithmically achieve these trade-offs? And in particular, does adversarial, current adversarial training practices actually achieve this trade-off, right? So that's another challenge that we're interested in. And, uh, you know, as we said, there's so many different things that affect the, these trade-offs in really unintuitive ways, as you will see throughout the talk. Uh, so, so we would really like to un understand how the size quality of data, for example, uh, affects this trade-off. Another thing is like model size over parameterization, for example, how does that affect the trade-off, right? So, so we, that, that's kind of our purpose to have some theory to understand all of these issues maybe simultaneously. Okay, so, so let me now uh, kind of more formally define the problem. So, so here's the adversarial setting we're going to look at. This is a common setting, right? So you can kind of view this adversarial setting as a game between a learner and an adversary, right? The learner as with uh, kind of uh, most machine learning problems uh, uh, has access to IID input output pairs, right? And the, the features or the inputs we're assuming is in RD, they're all generated IID. And then based on this empirical sort of training data, and uh, here the number of training data is denoted by N, the learner kind of uh, proposed a model uh, of, of an underlying parameter uh, of some sort, right? Uh, and then uh, at test time, what happens is, of course, you get a test data. But in this adversarial setting, the adversary gets to perturb uh, kind of the input to the test data in, in a way uh, that, that it wants, uh, as subject to some restriction on where that perturbation can lie in. But it can do this adversarially in that set, right? So it, it can really pick the worst case uh, in, in some sense. Uh, and, and this, this uh, perturbation could even depend on X, right? So it's, it's a quite a powerful adversary. The only thing that limits the adversary is kind of like the shape of this set or the size of this set essentially. Um, and then, so that's kind of the picture. At this time, you could maybe shift it enough so that you, you kind of change classification boundaries. So that, that's kind of the, uh, the, the setting we're, we're looking at. And, and so, so now that we kind of have a formulation of the setting, we can kind of be more formal also about what exactly these standard and adversarial risk or accuracy are. Uh, I'll begin with risk, but toward the end, we'll switch to accuracy again. So, so it's just simply um, the standard risk or error is basically the, the risk or error uh, on a kind of uncorrupted test data, right? So this is uh, you just look at the prediction loss. You can think of this during generalization for, for some specific reason. We, we actually are looking at a normalized version. We are normalizing by feature dimension, but essentially this is just a prediction loss on uncorrupted test data. And then the adversarial risk is actually, uh, again, the generalization or prediction loss on an adversarially corrupted test data. So, so, so basically the adversary gets to, you know, really mess with this prediction loss uh, and make it as large as possible. Uh, and then that's, that's going to be the adversarial risk. So, so these are the two metrics that we discussed. These are the two metrics that we, we would like to understand the trade-off for. And so in this talk, I'm going to focus on two simple models, but you can already, we'll see that a lot of interesting things happen already here. So we're going to look at this problem in the context of linear regression and also linear binary classification and, and try to understand these trade-offs. So let's begin with kind of a linear regression. 
So in this setting, it's kind of simple. We assume a planted linear model. Uh, the, you know, the model parameters are theta star. So you get linear Gaussian measurements plus noise. And we focus on an L2 adversarial perturbation, right? So uh, meaning like the set of adversary, the, the power of the adversary looks something like this. It, it can only perturb in Euclidean balls. Uh, up to like uh, this epsilon test, which is kind of the measure of the adversary's power. So, so this is the setting we look at in linear regression specifically. So, so and again, as we discussed, you know, we're interested in, first of all, understanding what is the fundamental trade-off between these two accuracies, right? Um, and this is regardless of computational power, size of the data, anything, right? You know, what is the best that any algorithm with infinite computational power and infinite data can do? And of course, you know, if you come up with an algorithm, right, it gives you a parameter, right, theta, and then you could say, okay, you know, in the, you could have the standard accuracy and the standard risk and the adversarial risk, and this gives you a point in the space. So you, so if you want to talk about the optimality because you have two competing objectives, uh, the the right thing to look at is kind of uh, sort of the the Pareto optimal curve, right? So because you have two different objectives, so 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 the question is. Do we know what the Pareto optimal curve is, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, of the, the, this problem, right? And, and so, so the answer to that is yes. So, so kind of our first result says, like, if you look at linear regression, um, you know, you can precisely characterize this Pareto optimal curve. You know, the formulas are not important, uh, but, but basically the, the curve looks something like this. So, so first of all, we, we, we can tell you like in this linear regression setting exactly what is like the fundamental trade-off between these two accuracies, right? Um, and, and so now the, though the question is, okay, now that we actually know this uh, fundamental trade-off, so what, 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 what do specific algorithms achieve, right, in this picture? And now specific algorithms obviously have limited computational power in some sense. And, and at the same time, they, they also have uh, uh, maybe limited data, right? So, so that, that's the next question. And that, that's really what most of the talk is about. So, so for this, we focus on a kind of a popular class of adversarial training procedures, uh, which is uh, of this form. Uh, they, they kind of take a min-max optimization form. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, this of course goes back uh, in the robust optimization literature for many decades, but specifically in this context, uh, it was introduced in this, uh, you know, uh, very popular papers uh, in the context of deep learning. So, uh, so, so basically, uh, you know, the, the, the setting is uh, that uh, uh, basically you, you try to minimize the parameter uh, but over the worst case uh, loss, essentially. So, so, so you have a maximization, right? The, the, you're using this maximization to robustify against adversarial perturbations, right? Uh, so so that, that's the algorithm. And of course, uh, this algorithm has a tuning knob, which is this epsilon. This epsilon is kind of, you can view it as a chaining epsilon, right? This is what your perceived power of the adversary is when you're training, right? It may be correct, it may not be correct, right? But, but that, that's, that's like the tuning knob that this adversarial training procedures have. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's two common uh, intuitions why this is a good thing to do, right? You can kind of think of this as robustifying via data augmentation, right? Because you're kind of augmenting the input features, uh, you're adding a little bit of noise to it, and you're making sure that uh, by minimizing the worst case, you're ma making sure that it's robust to this kind of data augmentation. And a second interpretation is that you, you can also kind of think of this as some sort of model smoothing, right? And so if you smooth the model using this max, uh, presumably it just kind of gives you a more robust, uh, you know, le learning algorithm. So, so that, that, that's kind of the class of algorithm we look at. Uh, and these are the ones that are popularly used these days. So, um, and uh, to, to kind of get a precise understanding of these uh, kind of uh, standard and robust accuracy, we look at things in a high dimensional asymptotic setting, right? Uh, as a reminder, this was our linear regression setup. N is a sample size or the size of the training data. D is the number of parameters or the size of the features. So the, these uh, assumptions are quite benign, I would say. It's just we're assuming that these dimensions grow in proportional to each other um, uh, to infinity and the ratio is fixed. Uh, the second one is kind of a mild uh, technical assumption on, on the fact that 
you know, empirically the vector should converge in two norm, right? Like the planted parameter vector should converge in two norm. So it's not a crazy assumption. I do want to mention that even though we, we focus, uh, I'll state all of the results in this uh, high dimensional asymptotic setting, uh, everything you can switch it uh, to, to high probability, right? Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the, as you will see, the, the proof strategy is very much amiable to this, right? So, so, so it's just that it's more convenient not to have to drag all of the probabilities around. So that's the setting. Um, so, so now the, let's actually talk about the results. So, so now the question is, okay, I have this adversarial training procedure. It's, you know, it's the, the, the solution that comes out of this algorithm. What kind of standard risk and adversarial risks does this particular adversarial training procedure give us, right? So that's really the question we're interested in. And it turns out that in this asymptotic setting, you can actually precisely characterize it. So, so uh, of course, there's no simple formula for it, but uh, you know, it's something that is computationally simple. So this is a high dimensional optimization problem. It involves D features and training data and so on. It turns out that you can precisely characterize all of uh, the, the, both of these standard and adversarial risks in this asymptotic regime uh, as kind of like uh, as a function of solutions to a lower dimensional optimization problem. And so this lower dimensional optimization problem only depends on five parameters and it's, it's a min max problem again. It's, uh, there's a min, there's a max, but uh, you know, uh, it turns out that it's uh, convex in the min parameters, concave in the max parameters, and the solution is unique. So, so you can easily run like a lower dimensional gradient descent on this five dimensional problem and just find the solution, right? And so, uh, you know, the, the standard risk and the adversarial risk can be precisely written out as the optimal solutions of, of these, uh, these kind of low dimensional optimization problem. So this basically effectively means that we can pre precisely characterize all of the nice properties that you're interested about the adversarial training algorithm in terms of like a very low dimensional gradient descent ascent code, right? So, so that's the gist of it. Uh, the formulas look ugly, but uh, you know, everything is computationally easy. So, uh, and in fact, talking about ugly formulas, if you're, if you're really curious what, uh, what this lower dimensional D function looks like, as I said, it's pretty ugly. Uh, but trust me, we've proven that it's convex and concave in all the right parameters and the solutions are unique. So you don't have to worry about any of those issues. Uh, you, you can just run the code and, and get the precise characterization. So that, that's kind of our, our, our theory for this. Uh, so that's, that's actually, now that we, we have a precise characterization, that's kind of revisit some of the issues which kind of motivated uh, the talk to begin with. So, so first one is, you know, we, we started with saying, okay, we're interested in seeing like what kind of trade-off does uh, adversarial training algorithm can, can they achieve, right? In this uh, SRAR kind of landscape, right? Uh, and, and so, so this, this is kind of the fundamental trade-off. This is like any algorithm with infinite data, everything, uh, infinite computational power. This is the, the fundamental limit that it is. So, so now uh, we, you, know, you, you might be wondering, okay, where does adversarial training lie in this picture? So it, the, the answer is it actually depends on, on kind of how much data you have. So remember this del delta is the ratio of the size of the training data over the dimension of the features. It, it turns out that the curves look kind of similar, but they're shifted. So as you increase the size of the training data, we can actually prove that in fact, at these adversarial training procedures do achieve this optimal trade-off, right? Uh, now, of course, uh, and, and they do get to the Pareto optimal trade-off. Of course, there's a interesting question of like, um, you know, given limited computational power, is this and limited size of the training data, is adversarial training the best thing you can do? That, that we don't know the answer to, right? Because this black curve is like the Oracle model where you, know, you have infinite data and infinite computational power. It may very well be that even with finite data, adversarial training procedures are the best thing you can do. I actually suspect not, but you know, we don't have a proof of this either way. And so that, that, that might be like the first interesting open question uh, out of this. Um, so so that, that's implication one in terms of the trade-off. So, you know, but as I said, you can kind of uh, start to study a bunch of different things. So for example, role of over parametrization. 
in this case, uh, you know, why is it called over parameterized? Because this ratio of the size of the training data over the number of uh, the dimension is less than one. Uh, so, so we're in this over parameterized regime. So, and already you see some uh, interesting things happen. Some of them are intuitive, some maybe not so much. So, first of all, on the left, you see theoretical curves. On the right, you see empirical curves. Uh, clearly, they, they kind of match uh, perfectly, even though we, we're, you know, we, we're working with finite N and D. Uh, as I mentioned before, these asymptotics are actually pretty precise, even in small dimensions. So, uh, but the, the, the kind of the behavior one sees is interesting. Uh, you can see that for small to moderate epsilon, adversarial training actually improves the standard risk. But the, as you increase epsilon, it starts to increase, right? So this actually says that even if you have unperturbed data, it is actually good for generalization to add a little bit of epsilon. And this is something that is kind of intuitive because, uh, you know, it kind of acts as a good regularizer in some sense, right? Uh, and and so, uh, so, so you see that. Another thing you observe is that though this beneficial effect of adversarial training actually goes away, uh, you know, as you approach delta equals one, right? So, um, oh, sorry, the, the, the opposite. As, as you over parameterize more and more, uh, you know, this kind of fat, fat lines, right? Whereas when, when you're close to one, this is a much sharper decrease, right? So, so some of these things a priori, it really may not be uh, clear that these curves should behave this way. And, and so this is why a precise asymptotic characterization is very helpful because then you can precisely predict what will happen. Um, I have a question about, uh, sure. from Solid that she's asking whether you have, you're making any assumptions on the labels and what are they? Uh, oh yeah, so this is all according to kind of this uh, planted model, right? So, uh, so it's a linear regression setting, you get linear measurements plus noise, right? Um, so so that, that's kind of the assumption here. Great. Okay. So uh, another one is kind of the role of data because we said, you know, model size also did. So in this kind of under, well, this is under parameterized regime, if you will. Uh, so size of data matters, right? So, so the larger de delta is, it obviously means you have more data. And again, you can see uh, the, an interesting thing happen for small to moderate epsilon, uh, actually, again, adversarial training actually improves your risk, right? Uh, uh, which is a little bit unexpected, right? Uh, but, but again, somewhat intuitive because of the regularization effect. Uh, but as Delta grows, as you have more and more data, this improvement kind of mitigates, right? So, so you don't see such an improvement as you increase Delta. Uh, and again, theory and empirical curves match well. And these are things that you could, you know, potentially intuitively guess maybe that this thing should happen, but certainly it would be nice to good, have exact curves of how this behavior happens. Uh, and so, so that, that's uh, our, what our, our goal was. Uh, so another kind of uh, implication maybe is in this uh, double descent curves. You know, I, I think there is a kind of in the theoretical machine learning community, there is some sort of obsessions of source, I would say, uh, with uh, perhaps justified. Uh, for to understand like kind of this uh, double descent uh, phenomena that happens. Um, so, um, which is basically this uh, standard risk uh, kind of peaks uh, as you, you, you have as a function of the over parameterization, which in this case would translate to one over Delta. So usually this peak happens exactly at one if you don't have adversarial training and there's a lot of interesting theory and results uh, by, by the community that, that uh, you know, that establishes that this and the behavior of this curve and so on. But it turns out that using this kind of uh, machinery that we, we, we're going, we, we have, you, you can also do this uh, in the context of adversarial training. The difference is that this, uh, where this threshold is changes as a function of epsilon and also the size of the jump uh, uh, changes too. Uh, and if you said epsilon equal to zero, we would kind of get all of like the results that already exist in the literature. So, so that, that at least is reassuring. Um, and, and so if we, uh, you know, again, as uh, since uh, people are interested in the, this kind of uh, double descent curves, uh, so the, this theory also can give you a precise characterization of that phenomenon. So, so let me, before I actually move to classification, which kind of has like a, 
a little bit of a harder proof and I'll skip. Let me just give you an idea of how these proofs work. Uh, it's actually like very compressed sensing in nature. So, so uh, it might be of interest um, to, to a lot of the people in this audience. Can I send you back one slide for a quick question? Sure. Uh, what's going on with the epsilon equals one curve versus versus the others? Oh, uh, it's a good question. So, so maybe that one I didn't notice that one. Uh, I guess that that one doesn't have that at all, right? Like it's completely the jump is gone, basically, right? Right. Yeah. Um, it it might be that just the adversary has way too much power, right? So, so it's very non-standard. Uh, but I don't have any good intuition why that happened. So, so okay, th there is one intuition. Okay. So, so the way I think about it as in the linear regression context is why does the spike happen, right? Because among all of these models, kind of the square matrix is the worst ill condition of them all, right? So, so now once you add adversarial perturbation, I suspect it's kind of like adding lambda, adding something to all the eigenvalues. And so if you add enough regularization, right? Like this ill conditioning of the matrix kind of goes away. Right, so that would be my intuition probably. So as you make epsilon larger and larger, in fact, it should kind of go away. It's because, you know, it, you, it's kind of like if I have a ill conditioned square matrix, but I add lambda to all the eigenvalues, eventually the problem becomes well conditioned, right? So that, that might be one intuition at least. Thank you. So yeah, let me give you a really brief proof sketch of this and so, so again, remember we, 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 we're going to, the, our goal is to look at the high dimensional optimization problem and characterize its properties using a much lower dimensional kind of optimization problem. You could even call it mostly a scalar optimization problem. Uh, and, and so the real question is how, how do you drive this function D, right? So the first step is in the linear regression context, this unfortunately doesn't work so well for classification It's like, you know, we, we, we're dealing with this mean max problem is that in the linear regression context, it turns out you can actually solve the max problem in closed form. And, and so you end up with the fi fi this, the, this kind of minimization problem at the end of the day. Uh, this is actually not too hard. Uh, if you've uh, kind of seen like uh, the trust region sub problem in optimization, uh, this is kind of the optimization problem you have to deal with. So it's kind of lucky because of this connection, you end up with a closed form. So, so that, that, that is convenient in this case. So that's the first step. The next step is, you know, you, you, you introduce new variables, right? This, this seems a little bit weird why we're doing that, but you'll see in a moment why, what, what the logic behind that is. So you introduce new variables. And so you end up with a larger minimization problem. So it looks something like this. Uh, and next you, you kind of like uh, take the dual of this problem. Uh, so, so by now, some of the experts in the audience, you, you, they, they can see why we did this, but, but you know, it, it seems like completely counterintuitive again, because you, know, you started with a maximization problem we solved, we all of a sudden take this tool and introduce yet another maximization problem. But the reason this is convenient is that this dual problem has a very specific form, which is of this form essentially, it's like U transpose XC subject to a regularizer. Uh, this is kind of the primary optimization problem. The reason it is convenient is uh, because there is a very uh, nice result uh, by, uh, by basically uh, Chris Somet and Bobak, uh, you know, back when they were all at Caltech, which basically says, okay, I have this, this kind of optimization problem. I can precisely character, you know, uh, characterize the, the behavior in terms of like a much simpler optimization problem. So here X is Gaussian. So I, I can basically replace this large matrix X with these vectors G and H, which are, which, you know, so it's kind of like I'm reducing the, the amount of randomness in the problem. Uh, so this is known as CGMT. Uh, you know, again, for people that are familiar with Gordon, uh, I think you can view this as like a significant generalization of Gordon. It's very much in the same spirit, but actually it's very subtle and, uh, and uh, you know, much, much more powerful than, than standard Gordon. So, so, so that, that's, uh, that's, that's what this machinery is. Uh, as a side note, uh, you know, with both Chris and Samet, you know, over the past few years, we've been trying to extend this machinery somewhat, I would say unsuccessfully, but you know, I'm still going to advertise it. So, so we, we tried to kind of extend this to the non-convex setting, uh, but we, we, we did not manage to get precise constants, but up to a small constant with Samet and then 
uh, you know, with, with, with both Chris and Samet this year, we tried to look at more coupled versions of this problem. The reason we're interested in that is because if you go from binary classification to, to basically multi-class, uh, those problems arises and then, but uh, you know, we got some preliminary solutions, but you know, it's not uh, exactly where we want it to be. But uh, this is kind of another interesting open direction, which is how do you uh, kind of extend the CGM team framework to make it more powerful. So, um, so, so now, uh, you know, using this framework, uh, you, you, you can basically, you know, replace uh, kind of this problem with a problem that more, looks more like this. Uh, this is often known as the auxiliary optimization problem, but here is where things get a lot messier, right? So, because then you have to still show this high dimensional optimization problem can be still characterized in terms of uh, like this lower dimensional one. Uh, and so, so there, there, a lot of the meat of this actually is in this part, right? And this is quite involved and actually somewhat different uh, from the standard CGMP analysis, right? So, so the, a bunch of things you have to show is like the fact that this is convex concave, you know, uh, you know, it admits a unique solution, all of that stuff, uh, you know, do you really have to do some, some places you, you really have to do a, a bit of a different uh, techniques than, than like kind of a CGMP framework. So, uh, uh, but you know, the general blueprint is, is, is similar uh, essentially. Uh, so so that, that's kind of like a, to just give you an idea of uh, how, how this proof works. Uh, so now uh, let me actually, uh, in, in the remaining time that I have, let me just finish off uh, with how the, the, these uh, stories kind of change once you move to classification. It, it turns out the curves there are kind of like, uh, in some times they are really completely unintuitive. So, so that's, that's why we, we started looking at this. So we're looking at a very simple case, which is just linear binary classification. So for this, uh, we, you look at a mixture model essentially. So, so you have uh, the, the input features are generated according to mixtures of Gaussians, let's say. So something like this, uh, and we're assuming the same covariance on, on, on the, the both of the mixture components. In this one, it turns out that we, we, you know, we, we can actually handle more general adversaries, uh, which is uh, probably more of an interest in practice. So it's not just L2, we can handle basically any LP ball. Uh, for our adversarial perturbation. And again, remember that this is a measure of the adversary's power. So, so in this case, uh, of course, the standard risk is more like classification error. So, so we are looking at linear classifiers. So just hyperplanes uh, followed by a sign, right? Uh, and and so, so in this context, misclassification error is obviously just the number of errors you make. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, often people look at accuracy versus risk or error. So, so actually we're going to switch to accuracy now because the classification problem, which is just one minus the kind of misclassification error. Um, and and so, so similarly, the adversarial risk is kind of like the worst case that the perturbation of the adversary, the, the worst, uh, like, you know, basically the adversary is messing with you and trying to increase the classification error. And the adversarial risk is like the worst case possible that the adversary can do given the power that it has, right? The LP per per perturbation power. And correspondingly, the accuracy is just one minus that, right? So, so, so now we all of a sudden are switching to kind of standard and adversarial accuracy instead of risk because the classification problem. So how does adversarial training work in this context? So because the binary classification is the general strategy is the same, but uh, you know, the, it takes this form where you know, basically the, the loss is you know, um, any of the popular losses are theory kind of work for all of them. You, know, you could have logistic, you have, could have hinged, linear, exponential, and so on, right? A bunch of different losses would work in this framework. So, um, so there is something that is actually fundamentally different, uh, even in the simple linear model between classification and regression. And, uh, on, and this is that unlike regression, uh, fundamentally these adversarial training procedures have two different regimes, right? One of them is a regime where kind of the problem is kind of separable. So it means that if the ratio of N over D is less than a certain quantity, it means that actually this optimization problem has infinitely many solutions, right? So the data, you know, the, it's kind of the data is perfectly clusterable or, I mean, or at least there are multiple hyperplanes, even robust hyperplanes that passes through your data, right? 
because the model is so uh, kind of like over parameterized or you don't have enough training data. So that's one regime. In this case, uh, even though the optimal solution is not unique, and in fact is, uh, you know, you can kind of show that it will be unbounded. It is uh, kind of well documented based on a bunch of recent re results that the direction that gradient descent converge just to is actually a max margin solution. In the context of this loss that we're using, the definition of a max margin solution would be kind of this. So typically, you know, you wouldn't see this term because of the adversarial perturbation, you would see this extra term which depends on the dual of the LP ball you're using, hence using the LQ ball. So it turns out though, the, the, this part is not that hard to prove. It's actually an immediate consequence of some of the existing more general work in this literature. So, so, so basically the solution is not unique, but the direction that gradient descent gives you is kind of like unique still. So, so that's the separable regime. In the other regime where the data is not separable, it's actually the exact opposite regime. In this case, you know, the solution is unique. And so, uh, you know, you just converge to that unique solution if you run gradient descent. So, so we really have to worry about these two regimes, right? And of course, the first thing we have to worry about is what is this threshold, right, of separability? And so that's kind of our first result. Uh, our kind of our first result is again in this asymptotic setting. Uh, here, you know, there's some, again some mild technical assumptions that the, the mean vector, the mean of this uh, kind of, uh, remember we have plus minus mu, uh, this mean should asymptotically kind of, the two norm should be a constant. And then there are some assumptions uh, about the mean versus, uh, you know, uh, sigma. This you can kind of think of lower and upper bounds kind of on your SNR in some sense, right? Uh, so, so, but in any case, we can again precisely characterize uh, like this separability threshold uh, in terms of this. Uh, this quantity, don't worry about it. It's kind of Gaussian width of some set. Uh, just to kind of reassure you that uh, the, these, these results kind of make sense. As a special case, you know, if you use an L2 perturbation, uh, the separability threshold uh, has a much simpler form. So it looks something like this, much easy, more easily calculatable. And as an, another reassuring point uh, is that uh, when epsilon zero is actually equal to zero, meaning like you're not looking at the adversarial setting, it actually again uh, reduces to like the separability threshold that has been derived in a bunch of re recent literature. Uh, you know, uh, you know, probably where I first heard it is actually in this work of uh, Candace and Sewer, right? So, uh, so, so, yeah, so, so it, it recovers again, non-adversarial setting uh, separability threshold. So, so that's the first thing. So we've now identified the separability threshold, but we have yet to identify the behavior of this adversarial training procedures in the two different regimes. And our kind of uh, theorem here actually does that. Again, it says that in both of these regimes, there is some lower dimensional optimization problem, much more complicated ones, unfortunately, uh, and different ones uh, that, that precisely characterize the behavior of this higher dimensional optimization problem. Again, everything is, goes according to plan in the sense that the optimization problem is convex in the min parameters, concave in the max parameters, uh, you know, and so you can easily run a lower dimensional gradient descent ascent procedure to find the unique solution. And then you can characterize both the standard accuracy and the robust accuracy as a function of the optimal solutions of these lower dimensional optimization problems. Again, the exact nature of the formulas is not that interesting, right? Oh, um, but, but basically the, uh, you know, the behavior is the interesting part. I should also mention that uh, on this one, uh, there was actually an interesting uh, concurrent uh, uh, and uh, actually mostly complementary work uh, by uh, Chris and uh, you know, uh, his colleagues and students. Uh, so definitely also check that out. Uh, so the, the papers are correlated, but mostly complementary as it turns out. So they look at a diff slightly different model. They look at different regimes and so on. Um, but uh, as, as you saw, Chris is one of the original authors of CGMT. So, so definitely check that out too. Uh, so just wanted to give a shout out to, the, to their result as well. So, uh, so, but now that we, we have like this precise characterization, let again, let's again revisit uh, some of these curves that we were looking at. And, and so, so the, and the, here is for example, standard risk and uh, well, standard and adversarial uh, risk, I guess. 
Uh, so we, we moved to accuracy, I guess, soon. So, but, uh, but you see in a separable regime, some of the observations here, again, theory and empirical stuff matched near perfectly. Uh, but it was one observation is that adversarial training helps with standard accuracy in this non-separable regime. This is actually the non-separable regime, but, um, you know, uh, but does not affect uh, kind of the, 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 the separable regime. So this is separable, this is non-separable. So it's helping here, not doing anything in, in the, these regimes, right? So, so that's, uh, this is P equal to, but uh, here's where it gets interesting. You change P and all of a sudden the picture is completely different uh, and you know, starting to be very counterintuitive actually. So this one, uh, you know, adversarial training hurts standard accuracy in the separable regime. You can see it's kind of uh, you know, hurting you. This is, this is, I guess, risk. So that's why it's going up. Uh, but then uh, you know, in, the, in the basically the non-separable regime, it first helps, then it starts to hurt again, right? And they, they, you know, they, they, these are just pretty weird curves that I don't think, uh, unless you have a precise theory, you could never probably guess this kind of behavior. And, and this one, even the adversarial risk is kind of uh, somewhat counterintuitive, I would say. Uh, and you see like you, you change P all of a sudden you get a completely different curve, right? So, so if we go to P1, uh, you know, the curve looks completely different, right? And, and so kind of the message is that these kind of, uh, you know, new kind of, opt well, these optimization schemes, these adversarial schemes actually affect things in a, really counterintuitive way. And so it, it would be good to have kind of precise theory to predict their behavior. Even in simple settings, you can see their behavior is kind of like, I would say somewhat unintuitive. And that, that was really what motivated us to, to look at this problem in some sense. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm basically done. Let me just uh, conclude. Um, so what we, uh, you know, the, what our results is about uh, providing some rigorous analysis of standard and adversarial risk slash accuracies and, and uh, you know, the trade-offs that you witness, uh, sometimes counterintuitive trade-offs in both linear regression and binary classification. So first of all, we kind of try to characterize the fundamental limits of this trade-off achievable by then any algorithm uh, or with any computational power or training data. But then we, we looked specifically at a very specific algorithms, in particular, these popular min-max adversarial training models that are so popular these days, and try to characterize those precisely. And you know, uh, one of the nice things about our analysis is potentially the fact that you can uh, understand the role of all sorts of different things, right? Whether it's a sample size, adversary's power, model over parameterization, uh, you know, even what kind of perturbation you use and so on. And so, so that, that's kind of like our, our framework. And uh, so, yeah, let me end it here. Thanks. Thank you, Madi. That was a great talk. Uh, if anyone has any questions, this is a good time to either unmute yourself and, and ask or post it in the chat. So we already have our first question from Michael. Michael, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so going back to the uh, SR AR slides you had, um, these ones, it, yeah, it, it seemed like they all follow sort of the same kind of curve, but like you have, you have those like sharp conditions that occur. Do you have like any intuition behind that or? Right. So, so the, the sharp part is because of the switching of the regimes, right? So these are where the separability threshold essentially. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So this is where the problem is separable. Well, I, I, I always get confused which one is called separable, but I think this is separable. This is non-separable, right? So yeah. So these are the separable parts. These are the non-separable parts. That, that's why you see this sharp change in all of the figures. Oh, I, I was misinterpreting the x-axis. Okay. Never mind. I mean, the x-axis is still adversarial power, but it's just the threshold changes as because you've changed delta in the problem, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, good point. I had also a question. Go ahead. So I'm just wondering if you tested this on any real data and does any of the theory work under 
less strict assumptions, like real data assumptions. Right. I mean, uh, we have not tested it on real data, unfortunately. So let me be very upfront about that. But, uh, you know, so we, we are optimistic that, you know, especially this kind of model is not completely insane uh, for real data. So maybe, uh, uh, you know, at least for stuff like MNIST. Uh, so, so the main obstacle for us is because this is not multi-class, it's binary classification. But basically, you know, for stuff like MNIST, you could very much uh, expect this behavior, right? So as long as you can calculate the, the corresponding sigma, even though it's not exactly Gaussians, uh, so, so the results should hold. You know, in general, this, this asymptotic theory is kind of known to be robust to the Gaussianity assumptions to some extent. For example, you know, at least you could expect that if you have, I don't know, like sub-Gaussian random vectors to see similar behavior. But, uh, and, and hopefully with the addition of the covariance, uh, you know, you could also get the ill conditioning of the data. But beyond that, uh, you know, like maybe, uh, you know, CIFAR, ImageNet, maybe you need more, uh, more interesting data models for that. So, so, so that might be a limitation, yes. But, you know, let me just add, like the point is that even in the simple data model, right? The, the picture is already, you know, like it's very counterintuitive, right? Uh, the, like how, how these things change, right? And so, so maybe, you know, the, the, we should not expect like a straight answer out of these uh, complicated training procedures, right? Because you, even you explained it. You explained everything so well. It sounds so intuitive. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, like what I mean is like this, right? Like, I, I don't know, like I would not have guessed this picture, right? Like, uh, I mean, wh why is it like going down then going up then going down again, right? Like, this is what I mean, right? So to so this picture, I kind of expected to be honest, right? Uh, you know, at least intuitively you do expect this one, uh, I would say, well, too far back, but, but something like this, you know, like, and it's also somewhat documented, right? That, yeah, if you add a little bit of adversarial training, probably it improves generalization, right? Because it, it acts kind of as a regularizer and so on, right? But uh, the, some of the classification curves, especially how they change when I change P, it's, I, I mean, it was, it, it, I, I was not expecting that, to be honest. So we have a question uh, from Jeremiah. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Sure. Um, so in the example of the double descent uh, curves that you had, if I understood correctly, you were plotting the natural risk uh, as a function of epsilon. And epsilon was the strength of the adversary. So these models were trained with adversarial uh, training. Yes. Do you observe similar curves if you plot the adversarial risk as opposed to the standard risk? Uh, so uh, again, um, I don't know if we've uh, drawn those. Um, it's a good question. I'm not sure if we've drawn those. Yeah. But uh, so, but you mean just like of uh, you know draw adversarial risk instead of standard risk, right? Yeah, precisely. We, we, I mean, we, we drew, drew a lot of stuff, so I'm, I'm kind of maybe not remembering. We might have that in the paper, but I, I think uh, probably they were not so interesting. That's why we, 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 we haven't depicted it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't remember if we drew, drew those. Awesome, thank you. So, were you expecting something interesting to happen there? I'm just curious. Well, uh, I'm not sure. Namely, I'm not sure if the same uh, sort of overall description would translate to the other side of the risk. I'm not sure if, the, if, if you would end up with similar curves. I would be surprised if you did. I see. Yeah, that, that would make sense. Yeah. But we could definitely draw it if we didn't, haven't drawn it. So, so we could definitely see how it looks because the theory would predict that. So just to clarify one thing, the theory can, I mean, the theory can definitely draw adversarial risk. What obviously the theory cannot do is like, if you have adversaries in the training data, the theory won't be able to do that, right? So, but we, we, we don't have a formula for that. Um, so just to be clear in case that was your question. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, great. So uh, I have a 
question, maybe. Uh, um, I'm guessing that you know when you were thinking about this stuff, your your end goal is towards what what's going on with neural networks, and so uh, what I'm wondering is, do you think the, the same techniques are going to generalize to a case where you have like a nonlinearity? Uh, in your parameter space and, and yes I think that, that that is actually a great question and we do have some expectation of this to be honest uh, but we, we, we can't figure out the math basically right but uh, you know essentially again if you go to this kind of model uh, at least uh, neural networks at least in this kind of like uh, what is known as the NTK regime, right? A neural tangent kernel regime do kind of behave like this model essentially. So, and this is actually one of the, our motivations for studying a general covariance matrix actually rather than isotropic, our lives would have been much easier if you looked at isotropic. So, so if you look at the NTK model it's essentially kind of a linear classifier but the, the, the covariance model becomes very complicated, right? So, so that, that was our motivation, but to make that jump, so meaning that we expect like with an appropriate, uh, you know, definition of the covariance matrix, the formulas to be predictive of that behavior, right? So, so you could predict the behavior of neural networks in the NTK regime, but we cannot formally prove that. So, so that, that's kind of uh, the issue. And, um, you know, there is some interesting work not using CGMT that is suggestive that maybe you can prove the, this stuff. Like I, you know, this com is coming for more from the physicist uh, side of the spectrum, like Andrea and uh, Montanari and Song may have a bunch of papers uh, in that vein, not for adversarial training, but in other problems. And so there is hope that maybe you could use some of those techniques to, to make this connection rigorous. But, uh, you know, uh, I personally, because I kind of like, yeah, and you know, a bunch of my collaborators like Samad and Chris, we're more from like the CGMT uh, viewpoint. And, and so what we would really love to be able to formalize that in a CGMT framework so far, we, we have not been successful, but it's a really interesting question, uh, actually. Yes. Uh, Chester, do you want to ask your question? Oh yeah, so that was that was really similar to the question I had. So I was just wondering if if your results imply that there might be techniques that like solve this robust overfitting problem in, in the context of deep learning. Right, right, and and um, again, at least uh, I, I would not say th this would not work for you know neural networks as trained in practice, but at least in this. Uh, NTK regime, I think at least it would be predictive because, you know, you can essentially think of it as uh, dealing with the general covariance, essentially, in a, with a linear classifier, right? It's kind of a kernel, instead of a linear regression problem, you have a kernel regression problem. And, and so, you know, you go into higher dimensional, enough dimensional space, you can essentially view it as kind of the same problem. So you could potentially predict the behavior in that regime. But formal proof, unfortunately, uh, is hard, right? So, so just to be clear, what the formal proof entails, it's actually a very interesting math problem, I guess, here, right? So, so as a baby problem, so just look at this, right? So the question is kind of like, it's not exactly that, but if instead of X, I put like uh, phi of W times X or something, right? That's essentially what the question becomes. Uh, you know, then everything comes crashing down here. But still, you, you, you feel like there should be still a similar theory. It's just that, you know, in the literature, we don't have it yet, right? And you can imagine that's so useful, right? Like, so that's such a massive generalization of Gordon and all of that, right? So, so it would definitely be useful, right, to have that. But, um, you know, in fact, given all of the, maybe the different math people on, on this call, right? Like, uh, you know, like if you have any ideas, right? It, it's, it's really a cool, useful problem, right? So even the simplest one is like, if I give you a nonlinear random transformation of a Gaussian matrix, you know, we have very precise answers for how to characterize minimum and maximum eigenvalues of a Gaussian matrix. But once you put this nonlinearity on top, like all of those machinery com completely goes away. It's really annoying, right? So, uh, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Oh, 
If not, I think we can all thank uh, Nandi one more time for this great talk. And uh, we will see you all next week. Great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.